jury Wednesday or Thursday. Um, and to an anticipate an another question, we should have jury instructions to you Monday. Um, we have if it gets to the jury on Thursday, we had told the jury that we won't be in court on Friday, which was to accommodate the court uh, not being able to take testimony. It dawns on me that if we get it to them, and if the court's available to take a jury question or a verdict, that it may be their preference uh, to come in and deliberate on Friday. Uh, instead if of they get back. the case on Thursday, they will deliberate on Friday. I will not take that break for deliberations. My, and, and that's, that's obviously our preference. The court had advised them that we wouldn't be in court on a Friday. So just in case they've made other plans, I just thought you might want to give them. So ponder if you want to. And the last is the scheduling this morning. It's not a little choppy with different schedules. We have after Mr. Peterson um, and maybe after the second witness, we will need to take a, a short break to uh, deal with some technology issues and uh, for defense to talk to one other witness that won't interfere with our time. But we may need to ask for a break a little bit prematurely just to deal with some scheduling issues. And Your Honor, just to kind of clarify on that point, I was, uh, defense has provided a PowerPoint today prepared by Dr. Andre. We previously interview him, interviewed him. Um, we were aware yesterday the state would likely be calling him today. But there are images on here. There's some descriptions. There's some additional uh, markings on there, which frankly, I'm not sure if they, they exactly are the same images that we previously received and questioned him on. I contacted our investigator, Todd Reeves, to see if he's available to come to the court this morning to speak with him, uh, Dr. Andre. I understand he will be here shortly. At this point, I don't know if we will be prepared to um, proceed on, on that witness, but we should hopefully know after we've had an opportunity to speak with him. So just for the court's um, full picture of, of what's from the defense perspective about that witness for, for now. Thank you. To make a, just to complete that record, he sent to me this morning, which I got at 8.30, he sent it about 8, I think, um, some slides that were both some of the um, actual radiological slides, which are just hard technologically to scan through. There's 1,600 images, and it's hard to do that in court. So he was going to drop those into the PowerPoint, and he's also added some um, illustrative materials so that's what I want to do is make sure the defense has time to talk with him and then we can sort out um, how we deal with that. So that was provided about 10 minutes after I got it. Okay, so that's just so you know what's going on. Thanks. Any further from the defense? There of a 
fire on November 16th, isn't that correct? That is correct. And did you create a written report of your work in that instance? Uh, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say report. Um, firefighter or paramedic Kevin Miller did the report for the incident. Um, I did a statement for the police department. Okay. So there is no written report by you about care provided by you to either of these individuals that you prepared, correct? There is a statement to the police department that does, uh, uh, it's a kind of an outline, a summary of, of care that was provided and treatment that night. It's about uh, half a page written on what, um, November 17th? I guess it would have been the 17th. It was written about 2, 3 o'clock in the morning after kind of everything was wrapped up from that call and, and additional calls right afterwards. And that was a, a typed up attachment that you prepared in addition to a uh, witness statement form um, indicating it was made under penalty of perjury, correct? Uh, correct. I wrote that up as a uh, statement for the, uh, for the police department. I, I believe they interviewed some of the people uh, pertaining to the case, but because we were transporting the patient to Harvey, we were not around directly after the incident, so they wanted us to write up a statement. Okay. But so what I'm saying is you, you had an incident statement from the Linwood Police Department that you signed indicating that your statement was under penalty of perjury, but you actually didn't put your statement on the statement form. You typed up a separate piece of paper and signed it, correct? Right. I asked that from them because my handwriting is pretty bad, so I asked if I could type it and attach it. They said that would be fun. Okay. And the mail that you first contacted, that was the person that Lieutenant Putz advised was a victim needing a medic, correct? Correct. And when you contacted him, uh, although not, uh, you didn't have a full report, you do note in your statement that you took the individual's O2, oxygen saturation, correct? Correct. Not initially, but once we had him back in the paramedic unit to evaluate him further, that's when it, his oxygen saturation was checked. Okay. And it was determined to be 94%, correct? I believe it was, yes, 94, 95%. I saw it right in there. Actually, you wrote it down as the male was found to have O2 saturation of 94%. Isn't that what you wrote the, the your statement? 94 at that time, yeah. Oxygen saturation is one of those things that can jump around. I mean, you can slightly move the probe on the finger and it will change around slightly. Um, it's, it's kind of a, just like a heart rate would on a monitor, you know, it's kind of, it, it varies between every few seconds. But, but, but when you were writing, so I so you're down in your report. Yeah, because I did see 94 on the monitor, yes. Okay. Because if you'd seen 95, or you'd seen 98, or you'd seen something else, you would have written that down on your report, correct? Correct. I saw 94. Uh, if, if there's another statement that says otherwise, perhaps that person may have seen it at a different time than I saw, but when I saw the monitor, it said 94. Oh, okay. So did you read your statement before you came in to testify? I did. Okay. And did you read your partner's statement? Uh, I read mine uh, before I came in. All right. Did you discuss with your partner that he may actually have listed a different figure for the oxygen saturation than you did? Is that, no. why, you, is that why you told us if someone else has something else recorded, that might be what they saw? Uh, I, I saw the report in the, like, the medical report that my partner would have written. And so in reviewing that, um, it may, um, and well, yeah, and I mean, I'm reviewing that material, and uh, yeah, I might have seen 95, but I did see 94 myself, and that's why I wrote it. Okay. So that's what and, I did see. And you were, I think as you told us yesterday, you were the hands-on person, right, with this individual, right? Correct. I was a skills medic in that situation. Okay. How do you call it? And the 94% oxygen saturation is an indication of potential uh, um, effects of smoke inhalation, correct? The depressed oxygen level. No, not necessarily. Uh, a lot of people live at 94. I'm at 97 most of the time, just for whatever reason, and I'm not a smoker. Um, people are different, but a person who might be a smoker might be a little bit lower. People have any kind of chronic uh, lung problem. There's multiple reasons. Um, a, a poor reading on the finger because of cold fingers. Um, and so there, there isn't a, uh, 
94 actually is uh, is not considered uh, uh, poor reading. Um, our Snohomish County medical protocol guidelines do not even call for us to administer oxygen unless the uh, pulse ox level is below 94. Okay. So below 94 would, re would require administration of oxygen. At 94 gives some indication of a lowered reading that might be related to smoke inhalation and it might be related to uh, uh, someone being a heavy smoker, right? Those are, those are uh, a few of many things that could reduce an uh, oxygen saturation level. And the reason that a paramedic at the scene of a fire might take the O2 level of a potential victim is that to determine if they are a smoker or the idea as to whether the uh, person may in fact be a victim of smoke inhalation? Uh, I took it not to see if they were a smoker. I took it because if that reading were in the 80s, lower, that type of thing, if I believed that they were, um, if they were, uh, had uh, very poor oxygenation, um, we're talking 80% or 70% or you're down in there where they are um, poorly oxygenated, then, then that would be of a concern. So, but it's also just part of our procedure with that, with that same uh, pulse ox that we put on their finger and it's hooked to our monitor. It also gives us a heart rate. So it's kind of a multi-purpose uh, device. And, and when you, your total involvement with this individual before you were called to deal with a more serious patient was how long? I don't have an exact time. Uh, a minute, two minutes, five minutes max? Um, I would think it would be at least five minutes, um, but not, not a whole lot longer. And you, was it you who sent him on to the other aid car for further treatment? Uh, I was not the one who took him in the stretcher. Uh, it was decided between paramedic Miller and myself that we would receive the next patient. Uh, and then he, after my uh, primary exam of him, that he could go to, uh, I believe it was Medic 10. So who placed him on the gurney? He was, he was taken to the other medic. Oh, well he was placed on the gurney while in front of the house. Uh, the gurney was brought to him by multiple individuals. I, I don't, can't tell you the exact names that were standing out there in the dark that helped him, you know, lift him up. So he was it. initially placed on a gurney, gurney. It was in wielding. that gurney placed into your medic vehicle, mm -hmm. and in that same gurney transported to the other medic vehicle. So that gurney was then pulled out of the, our medic unit. Um, we don't have interchangeable gurneys, so they had brought their gurney, we just moved him over to their gurney, pushed ours. Uh, actually, ours was then taken to get the other bit. So, so let's be clear. So, so yeah. it's your testimony that the other aid car brought their gurney to your aid car and you transferred him to their gurney before he was taken back to their aid car? Um, I was in the paramedic unit, not outside moving the gurneys. Um, so as I recall, Medic 10 had their gurney, or a gurney was there that he was then moved over to. I don't know where it was in location to our medic unit. I know that we got our gurney back in the medic unit with the second victim um, because that, like I said, they don't interchange with the uh, other fire district ones uh, uh, gurneys, which were the other medic units on scene. So. And, and was it you who gave the instructions to the other crew as to what was to be done with the individual on the gurney when he was transferred to the other medic unit? I don't give instructions of what's to be done. We all fall under Snohomish County uh, protocols and Medic 10 it has paramedics that I'm fully uh, confident in their abilities and uh, to care for the patient. So it wasn't you who, when he was delivered to Medic 10, indicated that he was to be treated for smoke inhalation? It wasn't you who provided those instructions to the folks in Medic 10 when he was delivered to them? No, I don't provide instructions. I'm not uh, the county physician who would do such. I, 
treat and I care for the patient under my care and, uh, and I don't give instructions to someone else to the care. They have uh, protocols and guidelines they follow under. Do you know who delivered him to Medic 10 with the instructions that he was to be treated for smoke inhalation? I don't know that anybody did give him instructions. Uh, we, we give a short report. We pass off like a, here's what we found, the heart rate of this, the pulse ox of this, this is what he's doing, this is what we saw. We can, we'll give those short reports when we pass off a patient, but we don't give instructions of what to do. Nice. Uh, we all fall under the same guidelines, and, and are, we've been, it's been spelled out on how we are to treat different patients. So in this short report that was given, was the short report given that this person was to be treated for smoke inhalation? I don't know that that was stated. Do you know that it wasn't? Um, I don't know what some other people, what someone else might have said to someone else. Do, do other people give you a report? Or is the report given by you or your partner, the paramedics who are actually dealing with you? Um, in that scenario, because we were going to be receiving a patient that we were being told was critical, uh, I don't believe, uh, like I said, I didn't go to Medic 10. Um, had we only had one patient, then I could have uh, transferred that care in that way of giving them a full report. Um, because this patient wasn't critical, like I say, I was fully, uh, I had full uh, confidence in Medic 10's ability to evaluate the patient. Um, I did a primary exam already. No reason they can't do another primary exam and come up to the same conclusions and, and, and get the same results as I did. Uh, uh, understanding that they can, I'm just asking as to were you or your partner are you aware of, sort of a yes or no question, the people who gave the report to Medic 10 when he was delivered to them? Uh, if when he was being moved out, I may have said what I had found. I don't know if the individuals that were moving the patient were the individuals on Medic 10 that night. We do not have, you know, we do not know who's on other units uh, until we, you know, talk to the person, but somebody just, you know, one of the one of the firefighters there helping move the patient. I don't know that they were the individual that was going to be primarily in care of the patient, and so I don't know that I gave a direct report to the person who would be caring for him. So who would you give the report to? I told what I found to whoever was moving the patient over to that gurney and would be going with him in that gurney. Okay. Whether they were then transferring him to uh, a medic in that medic 10, then that would be their responsibility to pass off that information. But I did not find any information that was critical or life-threatening or... Uh, it was a yes or no yeah, question. But I didn't find it. Had I found that information, there would I would for sure determine or pass that information along. And, and, and you spent a lot of time yesterday talking about people whose stories may not match what you were seeing. Uh, did Mr. Morgan give you a story as to the nature of his injuries or the cause of his uh, um, uh, behavior? A story is not always... That's a yes or no question. I'm just trying to... Did he tell you a story as to how he came to be injured or what the cause of his condition was. Well, if you want to answer no on that, then yes, there was a story told to By Mr. Morgan. By his actions the, and his I, words. A, a story is developed through more than just his words. And I developed, a, there was a story that was developed through his actions and words. A story you developed from your observations. And that's part of our job is to observe and determine uh, symptoms and causes that are going oh, on. Okay. And when we talked about yesterday about people giving histories and the idea of whether people's histories are accurate, did Mr. Morgan give you a history as to what had happened to him and why he was acting as he did? Did he verbally relate a story to you? Uh, he, he did not give me a verbal uh, indication other than uh, the words of uh, just a few words like I say of what kind of you know when we were probing for information about another victim uh, he did not give verbal responses to my uh, exam that uh, he didn't give many verbal responses no. and the information verbally that he related to you 
was about his wife being in the garage, correct? Uh, that's what we were able to obtain from him. And were you aware that he had previously indicated to Lieutenant Putz that he believed that his wife might be in the garage and that he had given the lieutenant the garage door open? Lieutenant Putz was, I don't know if it was previous because Lieutenant Putz was there present while I was, while we were both, we were both present when he was indicating such. Was a garage door opener transferred from Mr. Morgan to the lieutenant during the time you were with him? I don't know if I witnessed the garage, I, I don't recall witnessing the garage door uh, opener being transferred. Well, well, you gave an examination of Mr. Morgan. Were you aware of him holding or carrying a garage door opener at any time while you were with him? I don't, uh, I, I don't remember him transferring it. I don't know if he transferred it before, but I know he stated uh, maybe in the garage while I was present. I don't know at what time that garage door opener was transferred to Lieutenant Putz, but I did not witness that transfer. And you were not present during the entirety of Lieutenant Putz's interaction with Mr. Morgan, were you? No, he arrived on Engine 14. That was the first uh, arriving unit. And, and, and were you present when Mr. Putz, when Lieutenant Putz found Mr. Morgan on the ground outside of the house near the car? No. Okay. Now, when you contacted uh, Mr. Morgan, he was on the ground, he wasn't yet on a gurney, correct? Correct. Okay. And was it you and your partner who first placed him on the gurney? Uh, I stated a little while ago, uh, after initial exam of him there on the ground, uh, whoever was standing there in the dark, all of us in fire gear, uh, we all kind of look alike, but uh, whoever was there helped put him on the gurney. I don't have the names for you or the exact of who we lifted, you know. We, we place dozens of you know people on, on gurneys every day, so I, I you know we all get involved in that. I don't know who actually did the lifting. Okay. And, and you said that you had dealt with folks with concussions hundreds of times during your career as a paramedic, correct? Correct. And that indicate that the concussion can result in an altered level of consciousness, correct? Correct. And it can result in lethargy, correct? Correct. And confusion. And confusion. And, and Mr. Morgan was exhibiting lethargy and confusion and an altered level of consciousness. Isn't that correct? That is not correct. I did not witness lethargy. Lethargy would be if I, when I grabbed his shoulder to move him and it would be a slow response. It'd be a lethargy, just kind of like a sleepy type response. He had a quick response to that, uh, very alert, very articulate. So I never experienced lethargy. I didn't experience confusion. I, I experienced him not answering to questions, but when he answered, he was very clear on his answers and there wasn't any confusion that I witnessed. I witnessed eyes closed and not responding back to me. Uh, again, uh, it never seemed to came across as confusion or lethargy. Uh, there wasn't that that wasn't exhibited and, and you said you did a, an examination of mr. Morgan's person right a primary exam okay you know and you I think your testimony was you noticed no sign of injury I did not in that primary you didn't exam. notice an injury to his head I don't recall any injury in my primary exam it was like I said it was a primary which isn't the the detailed secondary exam which would be performed probably on medic 10 off and while they're out to the hospital I just want to be clear, since you've testified that you examined him and saw no sign of injury. Yeah, I don't recall any injury. And you had him out on a white sheet on your uh, aid car. Yes. Uh, and there was no sign of blood on that sheet, was there? I don't remember seeing any blood on that sheet. And if you did, you would have noted, wouldn't you? Yes. And no notice of blood on his person. Did I did not notice him. Because again, if you'd noticed blood on this person, you would have noted it in your report. I right? would have looked further into that. Okay. And no odor of gas or any other accelerant about his person, was 
No, his clothes clean seem clean, like maybe they, yeah, they, they seem clean like that. Not, it, not, not the physical appearance. I'm asking about the odor. Gas doesn't necessarily leave uh, a stain, does it? You can have gas on someone's person and not see it, correct? Right. If something smells as gas, though, I consider dirty. And so when I say clean, it, it didn't seem like it was saturated or it didn't have a smell or odor or look to it being dirty. Beyond not being saturated, there was no smell of gasoline at all that you detected. Isn't that correct? I didn't notice any on this person. Because certainly as a firefighter investigating a blaze like this, you would have noticed that in your report, correct? Yes. And, and knowing that you were giving a report to the police department the following day, if you had noticed gasoline about his person after you had already examined the second patient, where you <coughs> noted that odor of gasoline, you would have noted it for that report about Mr. Morgan if it was present, correct? Correct. <coughs> And it wasn't your decision as to whether Mr. Morgan should go to the hospital or be provided with oxygen at the scene. That was left to the other aid unit that more thoroughly examined him, correct? Right. They took him to treat him, and, and their determination of transportation and destination, that would be up to them. Yes. Now... <clears throat> You talked about the, the second victim, Ms. Welch, uh, uh, much more gravely injured. And she had, uh, I think you discovered yesterday, is an overwhelming odor of gasoline about her person? Yeah, I noticed it as soon as she was placed in the back of the medic unit over the time seen her. And now, yesterday was your testimony about this being her injuries were consistent with uh, somehow gas being splashed on the front of her, that's what you said? Uh, I said like a, something that was flammable. It would be uh, like gas or oil, I believe, I think I said. Well, actually um, you said yesterday that it was consistent with gas being splashed on her. Right, and I said and or oil, that type of, uh, it would be of that type of liquid. It has the same type of effect, a flammable uh, liquid. Did you smell oil or notice oil on her person? No, I was just making note of what her burns were like at that time, not the odor. Actually, her burns were on her back as well. Okay. Her burns were on her back as well. Yes. Right? So the, I, is the idea that, in your theory, something splashes over the top of her? Or? I don't have a theory. I just stated what I saw. And so it appeared from what I saw as splashed, poured, splashed. I don't know. It looked like it was applied to her. I don't know the angle or the route. Um, and, and applied how? I mean, to postulate that this is something that is applied to her, do, uh, other than knowing that you're here testifying in an alleged arson and attempted murder case, your claim that this is applied because she wasn't directly in the fire uh, in a standing or kneeling or any fashion like that with her lower body uh, free from any from, from the burns. Um, I guess that's why I, would, I say because it came into contact with her upper body, only the burns, the, that's the resulting burns. The burns on her buttocks as well as the burns on her back and her front and her arms, right? Yeah, I didn't. I, like I said, I... I just was making note of what I saw there on the chest. And I can't say how she received, you know, all Did, the did you make note of her injuries other than those on her chest? Did I make note of any other injuries uh, than injuries uh, on her chest? Uh, burns other than those on her chest? Um, on her arms, and uh, yeah, I did not make note of every burn, and uh, no. Okay. He was going to have a more thorough exam at the hospital. Okay. <laughs> Did she have a shirt on? No, not when I saw her. Open the ambulance. And now, in your report, you noted that the knees of her jeans were dirty, but there wasn't 
burning of the genes. Is that correct? Uh, I didn't notice any burning. Um, uh, my, I believe it was my partner, paramedic Miller, uh, mentioned to me when we were discussing this call, uh, you know, during the call or hour just after, and I don't know if it was in his medical report, like I say, I did see his medical report, um, that he might, that he thought there was a little burning maybe of her upper left thigh, but I didn't notice that initially, but I noticed that the rest of her genes were clean. But what, what you wrote when you were making your statement under penalty of perjury was that the knees of the genes were dirty, but no burning of those clothes were noted, correct? Correct. So my yeah my statement is uh, like I say it was a, a summary that um, now is there more detail that we got into and we get into yeah I you know I, I guess I, I kind of look at the statement the police statement um, you know it's very similar to if, if I were describing a car and I said it was a an old Mustang and then here I would say oh it's you know a, a blue Mustang convertible sixty eight or something you know where I I get into further detail to kind of draw and paint the picture for more accuracy, but, but it's not uh, anything, not consistent with what my statement was. So the statement is what you wrote then. Uh -huh. Now are you painting this picture a I'm, year plus I'm showing I'm showing the accuracy and the truth of the statement by explaining so that the jury can further understand and feel like you know, they can, can, are there and can kind of see what was going on. And, and after you've had the opportunity to talk to your partner and read his reports and consider if there's additional information or changes you need to make to your sworn statement. No, I was there also. I, I was there the whole time he was there with that patient. I, I, I know you were, uh, there's no doubt you were there. Okay. The question is, if you write one thing and then review other people's reports and talk to other people and testify to something a little bit different when you decide to paint your picture, no, I'm only giving you the information. The term a little bit different. It's an improper characterization. Can you rephrase, please? When you write, there were no burns, and say that you read someone else's report that tells you there may have been burns, and you testify about those burns now, is that a little different than what you write, a change from what you write in your sworn statement? Are you saying story statement? Sworn. 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 Sorry, after that interaction, I'm trying to get the question exactly. Um, the question is, is, are you testifying now to something different than what you wrote in your sworn statement? I'm not testifying to something different. I am giving accurate information and like I said painting a better picture, a picture that is 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 on my statement. And I'm just showing the details and giving the giving this, you know, laying it out for everybody to see what actually occurred. And yes, it doesn't it, it coincides, it doesn't uh, it's not different yes, than my statement. It was just a yes. Okay. <laughs> No other questions, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peterson, for being here. I appreciate it. More you ready? Thank you, sir. Could you give us 30 seconds? Uh, 15 seconds.
state calls the Cox problem. get settled, if you could state your name, spelling your first and your last name for the record, please. Uh, my name is Paul David Ruff. Uh, first name is spelled P-A-U-L. Last name is uh, spelled B-R-O-U-G-H. And I see you're wearing a uniform today. How are you currently employed, sir? Uh, working as a firefighter paramedic with District 1. I'm sorry. Working with Sonoma County Fire District 1 as a firefighter paramedic. Um, as you might be able to tell, she is typing out everything you're saying. So I need you to, you're speaking up fine, I need you to speak a little slower. Okay. Okay. Um, ever testified before? No. Okay. How long have you been a firefighter or paramedic? Uh, I've been a firefighter paramedic since 1999. Still too fast. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a firefighter paramedic since 1999. Great. Um, and any previous experience uh, prior to Fire District 1, or have you been with them the whole time? I actually started out with Marysville Fire District. Um, I was a volunteer there, then got hired full time in Marysville Fire District, and then uh, they sent me to paramedic school in 2005 at the University of Washington Medical One program. Tell us first about your training to become a firefighter. Uh, you go to several classes, um, you go through quite a bit of didactic work, but also on the field as well. So uh, life fire training behavior, you go through some, several college courses, emergency medicine, uh, fire science, and uh, you continue that training and education throughout your entire career. And so you received some medical training to be a firefighter? Yes, sir. At what point did you decide that you wanted to become a paramedic as well? I think uh, when I became uh, full-time and actually saw how much they knew, and how much I didn't know, uh, I really wanted to make a difference and help people out. So I uh, tested to try to become a paramedic. And when was that? That was in 2005. Okay, so about, you've been a firefighter for about six years? Yes. So tell us what kind of training you had to go through in order to become a paramedic. So in order to become a paramedic, especially in Somers County, King County, you have to be uh, uh, to get elected to go to Medic One program, you have to be a full-time firefighter, and you already have to be an emergency medical technician. Um, once selected, you literally leave your, your home and you live in the school, which is Harborview Level One Trauma Center, for an entire year, and you literally work nonstop for an entire year, tracking every single patient, every single procedure, every single uh, intervention that you did, uh, along with uh, classes and learning from doctors. Can you estimate how many patients you came in contact with during that course of that year? Thousands, literally thousands. When a call comes in for uh, a fire, what's your role in responding? Is it as a paramedic? Is it as a firefighter? How does that work? It's both. As a firefighter paramedic, you, you do both. It's life safety first and then property conservation and you kind of go down that line. Um, if someone's in need of uh, medical assistance, that's, that's our number one priority. Um, obviously, property and belongings is, is another one, but depending on the type of call, everything kind of evolves, and it doesn't matter where you're at, if you're on a medic unit or a fire unit, you're trained in both, as, as not everybody, but the people that went to medical school is trained as a paramedic and also a firefighter. We heard um, a firefighter yesterday, Officer Turner, testify that um, people can't be replaced, but things can. Is that sort of your philosophy going yeah, in? Absolutely. 
And so does your role change responding to a fire based on whether or not people have been in the fire? Uh, you know, every fire that we get dispatched to, we assume that there's somebody inside. We don't know how it started and several things go through your mind and try to plan your attack on how you're going to take care of that and mitigate it. Um, but the number one thing is people, correct? I mean, I mean, that's what we're going for, but we don't know. And as we're going, we get dispatched in radio communication and a computer system that tells us updates from whether it's a 911 caller or uh, uh, the first unit on scene knowing you know, how severe it is. And we try to do a 360 and all that. And, can and you do a 360? A 360 to paint a bigger picture of the call and letting the units that are arriving know, uh, you know how, how involved the structure or car is in uh, the fire. So do you sort of take your lead from whoever's in charge as far as what they need you to do? Yes, we do. So we have captains. So we have firefighters, captains, uh, battalion chiefs, medical services officers, um, and then so on. There's a, there's a ranking of us uh, all, but as a paramedic, you're the highest level of care for any patient until they come to a level one or level two uh, trauma center with a medic doc or a trauma doctor. What are the typical things that you treat someone who's been in or around a fire? Uh, you know, so physically you walk up and you look at them and you say sick, not sick, meaning are they super sick or super not, how injured are they? And that's what you do through your mind, whether it's medical or trauma. When you walk up, you visually can see if there's burns on a person, if there are, if there's not. You look at their mentation, you look at their smoke inhalation. So you notice that sometimes your hands start moving really fast. All right. It's okay. I know you, are you nervous? Oh, a little bit. I've never, no problem. Okay. Um, I just need you to just slow down All just right. a little bit. We'll do. Okay. Did you respond to a fire uh, located in Linwood on November 16, 2014? Yes, sir. And what information were you provided prior to arriving? Did you know what your role was going to be? No, sir. Responding with Somers County Fire District 1, we mutual aided with Linwood Fire, the city of Linwood. Mutual aided? Mutual aid. We are a county district department. And when there's a big incident, the next units that are available will assist in the, in the incident. Was this considered a big incident? Uh, initially, yeah, which was strange because at the time of day, it was about 1900, 7 o'clock at night. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are out and about getting dinner, going home and stuff like that. So most house fires that are that big usually occur in the middle of the night when people, there are not many people out to be able to see it. And when in the line of several responders did you show up? So I don't have the exact timeline, but I can tell you that when I pulled up, and we were probably, I was based off 156th Street uh, on Highway 99, and the fire was somewhere by 196th Street. I don't have the exact address, but when we responded, we were there within minutes, and there was a couple units already there. And as we pulled up, they were we have, uh, two Linwood firefighters were wheeling a patient to the back of my paramedic unit, which was at 10. Was this patient male or female? Male. Uh, we've heard some testimony that the only male there at the scene was the defendant. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. Okay. He was already on a stretcher? Yes, sir. Um, how did your interaction with him begin? So I got a brief short report from the other two firefighters that had him on a cot. Do you happen to remember who they were? They were Linwood firefighters. I don't know who they were. I don't have specific names, but they were two firefighters from Linwood. They wheeled the male patient to the back of my paramedic unit. As we're opening the doors, uh, they said, possible smoke inhalation. Here's your patient. Take care of him, and then we're going to go back and fight the fire. What is smoke inhalation? Uh, smoke inhalation is if you're inside the a fire inside, you know, uh, in close proximity with, you know, smoke, gases, heat. Okay. Have you treated people with smoke inhalation before? Yes, sir. Are there typical things you see with somebody suffering from smoke inhalation? Yes, sir. And what are those? Well, I've seen them from people that have hardly had any smoke inhalation and then people that are dead with smoke inhalation that have died from smoke inhalation. So if somebody's in a fire, 
disregard, you know, not thinking about heat, but talking about specific smoke, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, that people have black soot around the nose and their mouth where they're breathing. You can tell if they were in that environment for a while. And it, uh, you'll literally see black soot around their mouth and in their nostrils. And is that from breathing the smoke? <clears throat> from breathing the, the, yes. Based on your training experience of, of dealing with fires, is there a typical time that you need to be in that fire in order to have that soot start appearing? All fires are dynamic. It depends on how much is involved and how close you are. Um, some, and it also depends on what's burning. You know, there's there's several types of material out there that are, that produce more smoke and darker smoke or lighter smoke. At this point, you have clearly put on your paramedic hat, correct? Yes, sir. Did you pay at all attention to the fire? So I went back to the fire. So just so everybody knows, I went back to the fire after treating the patient that was in the back of the paramedic unit. As I pulled up with Medic 10, it was a cul-de-sac. And so we came up to the intersection of the cul-de-sac. And I want to say that house was three or four or five houses down on the left-hand side. Um, you could see the fire from that place, but I did not go to that incident uh, as Mr. or as the patient was in the back of the paramedic unit. At that point, I began all my treatment in the back of Medic 10 at that intersection. And, and we'll get to uh, you going to the fire in a moment, but I, I want to ask, did you notice well, the smoke from the house at all? Yes, you could, yeah, it was, it was in November, it was dark out, but you could see the black, thick black smoke coming out of the house. It was, yeah. You previously testified that when you're, you're first arrived at a patient, you need to determine sick, not sick, correct? Yes, sir. Uh, did you do that with the defendant? Absolutely. And tell us about your, your, your exam of him. So you take everything into consideration the call that you're dispatched to, when you pull up and you see the incident, whether it's a car wreck or a house fire, in this case it was a house fire, and you see the patient and somebody's wheeling you, him up to you and you start with your assessment, sick, not sick, whether it's medical or trauma on any person, that's what you say, sick, not sick, do I need to move fast, is this person gonna die right now? And so I looked at him and I didn't think he was gonna die, but I saw that he had singed hair on his forehead, on his uh, hair and one of his eyebrows, and looking at that, I couldn't understand why he had direct flame impingement, but no soot around his mouth that I could see. So at that point, I'm thinking he breathed it in and he ran out. Wasn't sure. So got him in the back of the paramedic unit, started our assessment, started talking to him, did our vital signs. All our vital signs were stable. His blood pressure, his pulse, his pulse oximetry, or pulse oximetry has to do with how your perfusion, when you inhale or uh, uh, take a respiration, it's a reading that can tell you what your saturations are. Uh, I can't tell you the exact number what it was. I do have it in the report, but I don't remember the exact number, but it was in the high 90s like you and I or anybody else would have. At that point, it just didn't make sense to me. Okay, and we'll get to that in a moment. You indicated that the O2 saturation is something that you wrote down in your report? Yes, sir. Uh, when did you author this report? <laughs> When I write the report, yeah. uh, right at the hospital after getting, uh, uh, once I released the patient to the hospital and pass the patient on to the doctor, I re we write our report at that point. I'm going to hand you what's been marked as States Exhibit Number 45. Do you recognize that, sir? Yes, sir. And what is that? Uh, this looks like a witness statement. And and a report, a my medical report that I wrote on the patient. Okay. And. Would that help to refresh your recollection as far as what you wrote down for the uh, pulse oximeter for the O2 saturation? Yes, sir. Yeah, so I, all his vital signs are here. And there's four sets of vital signs. Okay, and what was his O2 saturation? Uh, so initially his heart rate was uh, 103, his SP. So, um, okay, we'll, we'll post oximeter. Hold on, hold on. So when, when I get two attorneys talking, you'll just hold on for a moment. And it's really important that only one person talks at the same time so the court reporter uh, has the ability to track the conversation. 
So your objection would be sustained. We re ask the question and we leave the question. We take it down. Okay. So my question to you is uh, O2 saturation. And do you have that written down there? Yes, sir. And what was that? 86. And was that concerning to you? 86 was, is a number that I go off of. I don't treat off of numbers, I treat off of, off of patients. 86 could be, I've seen people a lot lower. So it makes me think that, is there a respiratory problem? So if I understand you correctly, uh, seeing that number, does that mean to you, perhaps I need to do more? I need to go further into my assessment. Okay. Did you go further in your assessment? With yes, you? I did. And did you see anything else when you were assessing him? Are we talking respiratory or are we talking anything as in trauma from head to toe? Um, let's go with respiratory first because okay. we're there. Okay, so respiratory, his lung, um, breaths per minute were 15. Breath, respirations per minute were 15. His lungs were clear and equally bilaterally throughout, listening oscillatum in all fields, six fields in the front, six fields in the back. They were clear. As that reading on my life pack 15 started to register everything, the saturations were at 98. At 98? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. You can go ahead and turn that over and if we need to refer to it, we will. So after that first O2 saturation reading, um, and then the subsequent levels going back up, were those other levels what you would consider within the normal range? Yes. Uh, requiring any sort of immediate treatment or care? No, sir. You talked about doing a head-to-toe examination. Did you do that? Yes, sir. Uh, please explain what you did. So head to toe exam, when somebody's not, when, when you ask questions to somebody, a patient, to figure out what's going on, um, it goes through vital signs, your physical assessment, and also your patient interview. Mr. Morgan wasn't really wanting to answer questions for me. Uh, his eyes were closed, I asked him to open his eyes. Um, he did that, so he was following commands, we call it neurological, Glasgow Coma Scale of 15, um, so he was neurologically intact at that point. Now, n looking at the fire, looking at Mr. Morgan, looking at his injuries from head to toe, I saw singed hair, a singed eyebrow, and a superficial abrasion, a superficial abrasion on his forehead. Now his clothes. Can I continue? At this point, it's narrative, the response to the question. Yes, that's fine. Let's, let's start with the head. You said, and you've said this twice now, singed hair and a singed eyebrow. Yes, sir. Why did you note this if the defendant had just come out of a fire? Why, why was that something that was noteworthy to you? So it means that he was close to the fire, and it means that he might have some burns and that I might have to treat him, and that he also might have smoke inhalation. Now, if he was that close to flame, then there's got to be smoke, and he should be. Did you see any evidence of smoke? No, sir. Do you have any uh, everyday examples of how this, this singeing can occur? I can uh, tell you from uh, my own example when I was a little bit younger, I was burning some uh, vegetation in the back and it, it was pretty green and it wouldn't light. So I used my, oh, this is my personal experience, I used gasoline on it and I lit it and it woofed and it singed my hair and my face. That's personal. What do you mean it woofed? <laughs> <laughs> That's first hand. What do you mean it woofed? <laughs> <laughs> so it wouldn't burn. I was trying to, uh, it was that towards the end of the day, and I wanted to get rid of the vegetation, and I was lighting it, lighting it, lighting it. It wouldn't light, so I used gasoline. Well, as soon as I hit the match or lighter to the, it, the gasoline burned up. So this isn't the same as, or was it the same as you walking near a fire that is already burning? No, sir. 
Have you ever put too much lighter fluid on a barbecue? Yes, sir. Uh, and, and had a sort of ball of fire? Yes. Um, are those, is that similar to what you're describing? Yes. Along with, and, and is your testimony that the singeing also indicates that somebody would have to be close to a fire? Absolutely. But that that would also necessitate smoke? Is that where you're testifying? No, it tells you that he's in direct flame impingement with flame or heat, not smoke. But you also didn't see any smoke inhalation? Did not see any smoke inhalation. You talked about a superficial abrasion. Um, where was it and, and what do you mean by superficial? The superficial abrasion that Mr. Morgan had was on his forehead and it's almost like like a rug burn or or a, something that slid off of it. It's not like an avulsion where it's torn open or anything like that. There was no... You, sorry. She looked at you because you just used the word avulsion? Avulsion, correct, which is not what it was. What is an avulsion? An avulsion is something that can bleed and, and be severe. Okay. An abrasion is probably the smallest little tear on the top of your skin with maybe a little bit of capillary rupture, a little real small, fine, but there was no uh, bleeding to be addressed. Was it, did it appear to you, <coughs> pardon me, to be swollen at all? No. Um, was it very discolored? No. been marked is state's exhibit number 46. Now you did not take that picture, correct? Did not. Um, do you recognize that though? The picture? Yes. Or the person? The person. Correct. And who is that person? Mr. Martin. And does that picture reflect the superficial abrasion that you are testifying about here today? Yes. Does it, is it, a true and accurate depiction of what Mr. Morgan looked like that night that you had contact with him? Yes, sir. Now, the state moved to admit state's exhibit number 46. No objection. Number 46. was not bleeding? No, sir. Did you do a further examination of the defendant? Yes, sir. Did you see anything that concerned you? No. Did you see anything on the defendant's clothing? Yes. What did you see? It looked like blood. Where was it located on the defendant? On the defendant or the clothing? Uh, either one. Uh, there was blood on the defendant's hands. There was no blood on the rest of his body. It was all on the clothing. And where on the clothing was it? Shirt, pants, and shoes. Do you have a, a, a standard way that you need to respond to this now that you're seeing blood? Uh, yeah, so we know it was a fire now that we know that there's some trauma. We don't know what the blood is from or who it's from or where it came from. And I'm assuming that it was possibly Mr. Morgan. So we 
I'm, I need to stop the bleeding. I need to take care of him. So we take his clothes off, and I still do not find any more any injuries that can explain all the bleeding. How did you uh, take his clothing off? Uh, so we're in the back of the paramedic unit. Uh, he's laying on a cot. Uh, we we removed his shirt. I think we can't remember if we cut it off or if we actually ha had him take it off. We do both. I can't remember in that specific case, but we had his shirt off and then his shoes and the pants. And then at that point, the clothing goes in a bag on the side of the bed in the back of the medic unit. And, and where does that clothing end up? With the patient in the hospital in that same exact emergency room. You now <coughs> have seen what looks to you to be blood on his clothing, correct? Yes, sir. Um, did you look for any kind of bloodletting injury on him? Yes, sir. Um, this is, uh, is this a fairly thorough examination? I'd like to think that my exam was pretty thorough. I take my job pretty seriously. Uh, I've seen lots of bleeding issues. And for me, if something that, has that much blood, somebody's, you know, needs to have some medical attention. So I actually looked from Mr. Morgan's entire body from head to toe, front to back, and I did not see any injury that I could take care of. You told us that Mr. Morgan would keep his eyes closed when you were asking him questions? Yes, sir. Uh, did he respond to you? He did. Did he present to you as being confused? I couldn't tell if he was confused. And this is talking about this entire incident with Mr. Morgan and myself in the back of that paramedic unit. And so you're always being like Sherlock Holmes trying to understand how can I make this patient better? Um, and going through the vital signs, everything that we saw. Um, I couldn't tell if he was just not wanting to tell me anything, or if he was intoxicated, or if he had smoke inhalation. I pretty much ruled out smoke inhalation from looking that there's only one, you know, two paths that you can go through in your, your nostrils or your mouth. I didn't see any soot. Uh, I asked him if he was had any alcohol or drugs. And what did he respond? He said no. Okay. So he's responding to me and he understands when I'm asking him questions. When I asked him specific questions about the fire, he couldn't answer them. And so now I'm trying to troubleshoot and figure out where his injuries came from. And my partner and I are in the back of the paramedic unit and I said, this doesn't make sense. How is there no smoke inhalation? If he was in that fire that I'm looking at right now, how is there not smoke inhalation? And, and I so I who are you saying this to? My partner, Les Frederson. Okay. And so, and he's an EMT. He, so he's a, he's not a paramedic, but he's a firefighter EMT. And so he's my hands. He's helping me, you know, take care of Mr. Morgan. <clears throat> and so I start troubleshooting, seeing I don't understand how this could have happened. Or I'm trying to piece this together. I'm trying to piece this story together. And I said, did a did a rafter fall on something? Because smoke and heat rise. We all know that smoke and heat rise. So could the fire have started in the attic, burned through the roof, and slowly came through the sheetrock and fell? Could it have? Possibly. And that's what I said. I said, is, is that is that possible? How close to you? How close to the defendant were you when you said this? Uh, the defendant was on the bed right in front of me where all three of us could hear me talking. Objection of what the defendant could or couldn't hear? Sustained. Move to strike. So. Folks, disregard that last answer. You were talking to your partner? Yes, sir. And were you standing yes, sir. over top of the defendant? Yes, sir. And you mentioned something about a rafter falling? Yes, sir. Did the defendant have any sort of reaction to that? Yes, sir. He opened his eyes, looked at me and said that that could have happened at that point. Okay. But that rafter that, the beam of the rafter was initially said by me troubleshooting the incident to figure out the extent of his injuries. Did you ask the defendant any other questions about this fire? 
Yeah. I did. I asked him how he, how the fire started. Where did it start? And what was his response? He doesn't know how it started. He was in bed watching TV with a remote control in his hand, is what he told me. And did he tell you anything else? And he said the next thing he knew, uh, there was fire and he was running out the door. said that could have happened. He, he had a reaction and said something to you. He said that, yes, that that could have happened. Have you ever treated somebody with a head injury before? Yes, sir. Have you ever treated anybody with a concussion before? Yes, sir. Oh. This, I'm showing you State's Exhibit 46. Uh, this is the picture of Mr. Morgan? Yes, sir. Again, this taken at the hospital? The picture looks like it was, because there was no pictures taken in the back of the paramedic unit. And is this the abrasion that you've been speaking of? Yes, sir. Did the presentation of Mr. Morgan that we're seeing here match with a rafter falling on his head? No, sir. You indicated it wasn't bleeding? No, sir. It wasn't swollen? No, sir. Now, this information about the rafter is not contained in your written report, correct? Uh, not in the report and not in my witness statement. Okay, and why is that? Because it was, it didn't, it wasn't part of the incident. It never happened. It wasn't. What do you mean it, it never happened? It was me trying to figure this out with as much information that I had at the time of the call with Mr. Morgan in the back of the paramedic unit. With him not answering my questions or wanting to answer my questions. Objection as to what he wanted to do? Speculation by the witness. Or rule. <laughs> so I was taught by a pretty good doctor, Dr. Copas, a uh, neurological doctor. And he was. Sorry? Could you say anything, sir? Dr. Copas. I'll, I'll try to find out. Very, very good doctor, very good uh, man. And he said that as a paramedic, you need to be like Sherlock Holmes and take care of the patient and figure out what's wrong with them and what can you do to make them better. And I've done that to this day. Based on the superficial abrasion that you saw in his head, did you believe, based on your training experience of both being a firefighter and a paramedic, that a rafter could have fallen on his head? No, sir. And did you believe, when you wrote that statement, that you would be sitting here testifying today? No, sir. In your entire examination of the defendant, did you find any injury? to explain how he was behaving? No. Uh, no further questions, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Cross. Thank you. <coughs> Actually, we talked about the abrasion in Stage 46. In fact, that is swollen, isn't it? In this picture, it is swollen. And that's the abrasion 
that you said that picture accurately reflected what you saw that night when you dealt with it, right? Um, no, sir. You didn't say this was accurate? I, I said that the picture is exactly who that is, Mr. Morgan, and that, that the picture does a superficial abrasion. Now, when a picture is taken, how long after when I was in contact with Mr. Morgan, when was that picture taken? I do not know. Now, I don't believe that was asked. It was so not. Quite, the question that was asked is whether the photo was an accurate representation of what you saw. And did you answer that yes? Yes. Okay. So is that an accurate representation of the abrasion that you saw? Abrasion, Which, yes. Okay. And that abrasion had swelling, did it not? At the time I was with Mr. Morgan, absolutely not. And when Mr. Morgan was brought to you, uh, did you and your partner take a gurney and go to the other aid car to collect him? No, sir. How did you receive Mr. Morgan as a patient? That gurney was being, with Mr. Morgan on it, was being wheeled to the back of Med 10. By Linwood Fire personnel? <clears throat> yes, sir. Were those, to your knowledge, the, med, the EMTs or paramedics who had uh, previously been examining you? I don't believe they, I don't know how they examined him. I didn't, all I got was possible smoke inhalation, he's an your patient. Okay. So there were, Possible smoke inhalation. He's your patient. No vitals have been taken. Okay. So the report you received was that this was a patient with possible smoke inhalation for whom there had been no vitals or uh, significant examination done. That was the information you received. Correct. Okay. Um, and your initial attempt to get vitals showed. Uh, an O2 saturation uh, of 86, correct? Correct. And that would potentially be consistent uh, on its, in its own, potentially consistent with an issue of smoke inhalation, correct? Then, no. No. Uh, protocol require or a call for the administration of oxygen for individuals whose O2 saturation is below 94. <coughs> Correct. Okay. And that reduced O2 saturation can be the result of smoke inhalation, correct? Absolutely. Okay. Now, while that is an indicator, you also did further examination, visual examination of his mouth, his nose, uh, for the presence uh, of soot or anything else that might confirm uh, 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 a condition of smoke inhalation, correct? Yes, sir. And those you did not find? Correct. Okay. And, and so Mr. Morgan's uh, presentation uh, appeared to have um, I was trying to think, would it, would it be a, 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 an affected or altered consciousness or uh, uh, some effect in his mentation? I think uh, you may have put it uh, in an interview when you observed him, right? Yeah. Uh, that's too compound. Just straight back. That's a mess. Um, you participated in a recorded interview in January of this year, did you not? Yes, sir and prosecutor present for the purpose of that yes, recorded sir. interview and defense investigator Mr. Reeves was present as well recording, correct? Yes, sir. And you described uh, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Morgan as, uh, I think, being uh, <coughs> lethargic during your assessment, is that correct? Exhausted and lethargic, yes. And. Um, uh, showing some, uh, I'm not sure, I can't right now recall exact term, but like uh, something affecting, potentially affecting his consciousness or mental state, correct? 
So without a scan, you try to make a, a mental scale of where somebody may be. And in that time, you need to know, or you have to figure out, are they working with you, or are they truly altered? Okay, but, but your concern at that time, when you were assessing him, was the potential for uh, him having uh, something that had resulted in a potentially altered mental state, correct? With every patient, we give them the benefit of the doubt. And you asked him about alcohol and drug use, correct? <clears throat> yes, sir. Now, there was no odor of alcohol about Mr. Morgan's person, was there? No, sir. And there was no odor, odor of gasoline or any other accelerant about Mr. Morgan's person, was there? Are you? I'm asking you. So I'm in the back of the paramedic unit, and I do smell gasoline once I remove the clothing. Now, I don't know if it's gasoline, and I don't know if it's gasoline. I'm telling you that it smelled like gasoline to me on the clothing. Now, the back doors of the paramedic unit were open, and the motor was running. Okay. So I don't know where that came from. At that point, the clothing was put in a bag and sealed. And did you note in your report that there was an odor of gas about Mr. Morgan's clothing? Uh, I don't remember. I think I mentioned it, but I did say that they were wet. And with, it being, with them being wet, I couldn't tell if it was water, blood, or gas. Yes. Oh, you have a copy of your report? Would yes, it refresh sir. your recollection to look at that report to determine if, in fact, you made any notation about there being an odor of gas about his clothes? conversation that you say you had with Mr. Fredrickson, your, your fellow firefighter, uh, about um, potentially falling beams, that was because the symptoms that Mr. Morgan was exhibiting potentially consistent with someone who is concussed, correct? And you were trying to determine if, in fact, Mr. Morgan could have received a blow to his head from a rafter or some other source as part of the fire, right? Yep. And what I want to be clear is that what Mr. Morgan, you asked him if he knew how the fire started, and he said no. Isn't that correct? Yes. And you asked him if he knew where the fire started, and he indicated no. Isn't that correct? Yes. What he did tell you was he was watching television on the second floor when something struck him in the head. Isn't that what he told you? No, sir. Okay. Now. There's nothing written in either your statement to the police department or your report of treatment for Mr. Morgan as to what he said. Isn't that correct? Uh, he, I do have some quotes in here that he did what he did say. Okay. About what had struck him in the head? No. Okay. Because he did not say that. And is your memory of this event better today than it was over a year ago? No.
And that concern about Mr. Morgan being concussed was based on your observations of both his presentation and the abrasion to his head, correct? So with every single patient that we have contact with, we, we do physical and mental assessments. So regardless if somebody is in no neurological compromise or are, they all did that same exact assessment. Okay, that wasn't the question. The okay. question was, you had observed Mr. Morgan's deportment and you had observed Mr. Morgan's injury to his head prior to uh, your conjecture about him being struck with an object. Isn't that correct? I asked him if he was, I'm sorry. You asked him if he was struck with an object. I was, no, what I said was maybe a, a rafter fell down and hit him in the head. And the reason you had said that is because you had noted the injury to his head and you'd noted his behavior that was consistent with being concussed. Negative. Isn't that correct? Negative. Okay. Unwilling to cooperate. So falling timbers cause a lack of cooperation in your experience? That, that's why you would Falling think... timbers kill people, sir. Oh. So then your idea that a rafter could have hit him would not have been an explanation for why he was alive with a head injury and acting like he was concussed. His head injury was not consistent of a rafter falling on somebody's head and fired. Okay. Uh, I didn't suggest that. Um, uh, I'm just wondering your discussion and, and, and are you certain that in fact it was a discussion of rafters and that uh, striking him in the head. Rafter, truss, or beam, something from the attic. <clears throat> and at this point you're saying you are certain that he simply didn't tell you that something had struck him in the head. He did not. And when asked by Mr. Fredrickson what it was, that he said he didn't know. So, when I was interviewing Mr. Morgan, I said, could a rafter have fallen down and hit you in the head? And at that point is when he opened up his eyes. But prior to me saying that, there was no discussion or him saying that he was hit in the head or had anything had happened other than there's a fire in the house and I ran out. All right, so what I want to be clear right now, before you had told us this was a conversation between you and Les Fredrickson. Us three. The conversation, you were, you were just trying to be clear. Right now you just said this is something you specifically asked Mr. Morgan. Is that what you're saying happened? So I am talking out loud, trying to paint this picture, and asking myself, Talking to myself out loud, I wonder if a rafter could have fallen and hit him in the head. And my partner on the side was right there. He heard it. Mr. Morgan heard it. And at that point is when he said that a rafter could have hit him in the head. And are you sure that it wasn't Mr. Fredrickson asking him what happened? that he said that something hit him in the head, that Mr. Fredrickson asked him what, and he said he didn't know. I do not recall that. And your statements don't reflect any part of this conversation, do they? No, because it's not, it wasn't uh, part of the incident. It was not part of the incident. It did not happen. I might just have one more. Oh. You indicated.
indicated the singed hair and singed eyebrow would be consistent with being near to a flame, correct? Yes. Like if someone that was on fire came running at you? If flame period, I don't think it has to do with a person or a lung or structure. Okay. And, and just to be clear, in your statement, you didn't note that you smelled you, you said Mr. Morgan's clothing was wet. <coughs> I did smell fuel, but it could very well have been from the M10, M10, Medic 10 apparatus. Isn't that correct? Correct. No other questions. Thank you. Can you redirect? Very briefly. Also, I forgot my water. You checked his uh, vitals, correct? Yes, sir. Mr. Wackerman asked you about the defendant presenting as uh, exhausted and lethargic. Yes, sir. Did you find any vitals to uh, explain being exhausted and lethargic? No, sir. But just so you know, with the initial sabering of 86 on a pulse oximeter, when you first turn on the unit, they don't start out at 100% and work their way down. They start low and work and work their way up and read. Now, if your saturations are low, you're probably going to be super tachycardic at a fast heart rate. 120, 130, 140. Mr. Morgan was just above normal sinus rhythm. You're creating a whole list of words I'm going to look up how to spell for her. So if I were to stand here right now, if my saturations were 98%, I could hold my breath right here and let it slowly drop. And those numbers would drop. And over six minutes, my heart rate would increase. Okay. His heart rate never it's increased. Point, Your Honor, that object is right. not responsive and asked to strike. So if there's no question from him, so I'm going to strike his answer. Ask the jury to disregard that and allow you to proceed. First reading was 86. Yes, sir. You've explained why that, why that could have been. Yes, sir. Uh, objection. Actually, that was stricken. No, actually, his previous testimony. There was a second reading of his O2, which was within the normal range. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Among all of his other vitals that you took, did you find anything that would lead you to believe he had a concussion? No, sir. The abrasion that was on his head, would you describe that as an injury? Superficial injury. Okay. Tissue. Okay. And when you were saying, as far as the rafter falling, that it didn't happen, um, you're not trying to say that he didn't say it, correct? Jack correct. Jack leading. Oh, right. uh, why is it not in your report? Because it did not happen. Oh, right. Sorry? Because it did not happen. To the defendant? Correct. Thank you. No further questions. No further questions. Thank you.